simply born. Um, they're forged through the challenges of life and with each challenge, they grow mentally and emotionally. They move forward with their heads held high and the strength that cannot be denied. And a woman who has stormed, who has been through such a storm and has yet survived, she is a warrior. And today we have with us one such warrior. This woman has not just made it big, but she has made it worthwhile. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an absolute honor for me to present to you Miss Marie Rodriguez. Well, Marie was born in 1978 in a beautiful country in Venezuela. There are three sisters who saw their childhood in the slums of Venezuela, like facing everyday hardships and financial crisis until they made it to the US in 1992, which is long, long back. Her life wasn't all smooth and silky as yet. She was still coping with the cultural shock as she continued her high school. And she later took her bachelor's degree in communications and organizational leadership from the Trinity International University and her master's in communication and media studies from Georgetown University. Well, today, in today's date. This woman is heading the post of Global Head of Internships in Microsoft. She is an award-winning storyteller, mastering the field of brand storytelling, personal branding, and youth entrepreneurship. I mean, kudos. She's a motivational speaker. She's a volunteer. She's a proud mother, and she's an accomplished author. She recently launched her book named Brand Storytelling. Well, we have the link in the description box. If you haven't checked that out, do it right away. It is a stepwise guidance as to how to put your customers at the heart of your storytelling. It's you need to buy it. I mean, if, you, if you're if you a Kindle user, you can buy the Kindle subscription, but do buy it before it goes out of stock because it has gone out of stock once before. And I think with that, um, I'd like to thank all our attendees from all across India and across the world. Thank you for joining us. We've received an overwhelming response. Um, I mean, thank you for giving us your time. You're not going to miss a single second. I mean, it's going to be everything that you wanted. And um, if you have any questions, put them down in the link description and the comment section, whatever below, and we'll take it up towards the end. And I think I, this is from my end. I have yapped a lot <laughs> already. So, well, the next voice we will be hearing will be the woman herself, a woman shaved of experiences and hardships. Ladies and gentlemen, Miri Rodriguez, the platform is all yours now. Please begin. Wow, this is an incredible <laughs> introduction. Thank you so much. Um, where do I start? I, where do I, I? I think you should be doing this whole thing. You're amazing. Thank you for that. Thank you. you know, Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Uh, I hear there's a lot of people from many parts of the world, and this excites me so much. I hear there's people from Nigeria. Uh, I love Africa. I've been there. I've done three tours of Africa. Um, yeah. I haven't had a chance to do India yet, but I, I was actually scheduled to do that uh, this March. And unfortunately, due to this uh, COVID-19 situation, I didn't get out there. But I do well, hope to get out next there. Next time today. you do come to India... Please schedule a meeting. We would. I would love to. Oh, meet absolutely! You. <laughs> you are on. Absolutely, we should. We Please should do visit that. Visit the I university. That. We'd love to have you. We'd love oh, to host you. Yeah. Give us a chance, please. Yes. Absolutely. I have a lot of friends from India and I, I do see a lot of similarities on our cultures and how women yeah. are raised. Um, and, you know, I came, as you said, as you announced, I came from Latin America. And so um, very strict household, very male dominated as well. In fact, Plus one. I, yeah, <laughs> for me, it was it was really hard. I was I'm the middle child. Um, so I have an older sister, a little sister, and I'm very outgoing in my, you know, I'm, I'm an extrovert. Um, but in a culture where for me, you know, I was it was a very religious culture, a very male dominated culture, a very Latin culture. It was hard. It was hard being, you know, curious and loud, a little girl. It was hard for me to come out and ask a lot of pertinent questions. And, and it was hard for me to deal with my personality. I, in fact, I, I I, I, I think I resonate with you on, a, on, on another level right now. Yeah. On another yeah. level. Yeah, <laughs> very much. I mean, it's so difficult. I think the, 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 um, the societies a little, um, they act weird to um, women who are not ready to take bullshit, I think. Absolutely. Women who are straight. 
you know, absolutely on the point you know yeah and that that clashes uh with the way that you're brought up and also uh you know women are seen not heard they're supposed to be home uh so there's a lot of you know there's a lot of clashes that we we find in generations um where there's an old school generation as well so it's also generational and then what we are seeing this movement of women uh like you who's watching right now that are seeking uh to grow are seeking to find themselves um in a world where you don't even know where to start so i think this this session here is going to help you uh, i'm going to teach you i'm going to show you my way the way that i learned it my own experience uh and hopefully that will incite you to think about your own journey and and one thing that i want to share is you know i i'm no one Special. I really am not. I know that there's a lot of great things that you said, and thank you for that. But honestly, it's not ordinary. It's not extraordinary. It only is something that I did because I proposed it. I actually purposed it for myself. So uh, you can too, and you should too. Uh, you're full of talent. You're full of so many things. Uh, even though I don't know you, I know that about you because I found myself in the same place a long time ago, not knowing who I was. And this is what this is about today. It's about finding your way and finding yourself. Finding your way and finding yourself. Well, well on that note, uh, I'll leave the platform all to you. Um, this is your audience. Um, Thank you. You know, have okay. a great time. Thank you very much. Thank Bye -bye. you. I'll see you on the other end. See you on the other end. And please do put, post your questions uh, on the chat. I, we will try to get to them as much as possible. And if you don't, if we get, don't get to all of them at the end of the session, uh, please be sure to connect with me. I'll, I'll love to answer your question personally if I, if I can. Um, so, so here it is. Let's, let's talk about branding. So for me, as I said earlier, I just, I was in a place in my life. I found my, myself in a place where I didn't know who I was and I didn't have anyone help me, helping me. I kind of navigated my first few years. I came to the United States when I was 13, didn't speak the language, didn't have friends. In fact, I didn't want to be here. I, I was, I was better in my country. I, I, it was a culture shock of all kinds. Um, we landed in Miami and there was, you know, we thought it would be easy because in Miami, you, there's a lot of people that speak Spanish, but the people that were there that spoke Spanish were actually Cubans. Um, and so there was also a culture shock between Cubans and, and Venezuelans. So it was really weird for me to kind of come in in a, in a space where I feel like I didn't belong. Um, and I, I think you may have felt that once in your life. Maybe you feel that right now, like you just don't belong. You're there and imposter syndromes like yelling at you. You don't belong here. You're not supposed to be here. You don't even know who you are. And that's where I was. I didn't even know what branding was in that time. Um, and then I realized that now that I'm here, that there's key elements to branding. So this is what we want to start with is the idea that branding has a mission. Your life has a mission. Your brand has a mission. It has attributes. It has character. It has a, a person, which is you. It has other people who have enabled you to be where you are today or been part of your journey as a story, uh, as a storyteller that I am now, I wasn't back then, but I knew that, you know, I had, I was born one day, I had a story. I just didn't know, didn't know that I had an, an intentional story that, you know, up until that point, what was my story? What was the purpose? What was the mission? Um, and it has SEO. It has a, a digital component to it that when we search, you know, you know, for your, for your name online, uh, we expect to find something, but that didn't, that didn't come across to me immediately. I didn't know these things about branding. I didn't know these things about storytelling about myself. In fact, when I started this journey, this is the picture here of me when I was, uh, when I began this journey at Microsoft, it began actually at Microsoft in 2012, Microsoft called me out of nowhere. I was at another company and they just said, Hey, we want you to come work for us. So I was like, okay, great. I will. And this is, um, my profile picture that I took uh, the first week that I got there. I was excited to join. Um, and then I wasn't excited anymore. I was excited to join at first. And then I learned uh, very quickly within a few months that I was actually not not belonging there. Um, I came into the LATAM, which is Latin America um, operations field. And there were four women who began bullying me very heavily. Um, and I was shocked. I didn't know what had happened. I didn't know why. I didn't know if it was me, what I had done, what was going on. Um, I spent the next year actually trying to figure out if it was me. I spent the next year um, feeling very alone. Um, and then one day I woke up, I got went to work and I just couldn't handle it anymore. I went to work and one, two of these women had done something to me again. And I literally grabbed my laptop and I said, 
I'm leaving. I can't do this anymore. I was around 30, I want to say 33, uh, maybe 32. And so um, I was just not, not happy. Um, I went home and I wanted to quit. This man grabbed me. He was a program manager who saw what happened. He grabbed me by my arm and he said, you're not going anywhere. You're going to stay at Microsoft. And I was like, well, I don't need to stay at Microsoft. I don't need to put, put up with this anymore. I, I, I've been trying for a year. And he says, no, I, I, you need to go home. You need to think about this, but you need to come back um, because we need you at Microsoft. So I went home and I thought about what he said. I was like, do I quit? And if I quit, where do I go? And if I don't quit, why would I stay? And the question of why really hit me hard. That is when I realized that I had no purpose. Up until that point, I had been living my life with no purpose. I was just navigating life through what it came. I had jobs, I had career, but it was it was just because an opportunity came up or this came up. I was kind of climbing the ladder-ish. I had no purpose. In fact, I had mixed attributes to who I was. Sometimes I was kind, sometimes I was sarcastic, sometimes I was this, sometimes I was that. I didn't have an assigned attribute to, where, where people could say, hey, this is Miri and she is this. Hey, this is Miri and she does this. I, I didn't have anything that I was intentionally building for myself. I had no character definition. You know, I didn't know in this story of mine, my own story, I didn't know who I was. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what my purpose, my mission was. I had no story. I had no story, even though my story, I had been living it. One day I was born, that's a story. I had grew up, that's a story. I came to this country, that's a story. But I didn't know how to connect those dots of my life, of this, these happenings, these data points that were happening in my life to weave who I was going to become. And if you Googled me at that time, you would probably only find my address. In fact, you would only find my address or my parents. That's it. That's all you would find on me. And this is where I want to share with you what happened to me because it was remarkable at the time when I went home and I asked myself, if I came back to Microsoft that next day, why would I do that? And it dawned on me. It dawned on me that if I left, you know, there's only 2% of us uh, women in tech in this industry. If I left, I would actually reduce that gap. It would become smaller. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to contribute to expanding. I wanted to contribute to being more women in tech. I know as women, it is hard. It is so hard. We have to double, do the double work. We have to do extra things. We have to prove ourselves harder. And I was like, you know, it's easier to quit. That is much easier. And then when you get in, more the only few women that are there that are there, they're competitive and they attack you. It's like, who wants to be that? Who wants to do that? But for me, it didn't become about me anymore. That why question made me and forced me to think about my real mission that went before me. And this is what I came with, I came up with at that time. A brand mission statement. Nobody gave me this. I didn't go to you know a class. I didn't have any mentors. I just thought this would help me define my next steps, really the next chapters of my story that had yet to be written. And this is what I want to share with you. This brand mission statement is what gives you a purpose. For me, it was saying, okay, what am I right now? I am what and black and what? Uh, blank and blank. Uh, because the world needs, there's something that I can probably give the world. I don't know what it is yet. At that time, I had no idea what it was. Um, but there's something I could probably do for the world in order to do what? Well, that would be my legacy. I know I wanted to leave a legacy. Long after I'm gone, could I have said, hey, I've touched someone's lives. I, I, I was able to inspire someone. I was able to, to do something for someone beyond myself, outside of myself, beyond the noble of like, okay, my kids and my, and my husband. So that is what I went out with. And this is what I want to share with you. If you use this, I want to break this down real quick to think about how to fill this out. Because I know, I know this is a lot to unpack here. So, so stay with me. I hope you're writing down your questions, but maybe, maybe I can help answer some of them right now. For me, it was really thinking about first who I was at the moment, right? I didn't know who I was, as I said. So I went out and I asked people. I asked a lot of people the question, hey, how do I show up? So this is your first order of business today. For you to understand who you are right now and where you're going to go, you need to know who you are right now. And for you to know that is your brand is not who you say you are. It's how you make people pe feel. When you walk in a room, people are already making having a, an assessment of you. That we're all judging each other, basically, right? We we are looking to see who this person is, what they're saying, and we're making assessments of each other. So you show up a certain way to somebody, even if you don't want to intentionally. The way you dress, 
the way you enter the room, the way you sit in the table, where you sit on in the table, on in the table, in the you know where you sit in the room. All of that is creating data points of your story of your brand, and people are analyzing that data. People are thinking about it. People are weaving a story about you, even though you're not telling it yourself. And this is where branding is really important because you have the power and you should have the power because it's your story to build that for yourself. If you show up a certain way and you don't want to show up like that anymore, guess what? You can change it. This is you. You get to change your own brand story. You get to change your own brand brand mission. You are the CEO of your life. So you get to say, hey, I don't want to show up like this anymore. I'm going to start showing up like that. And I'm going to start branding myself this way. And then you do. So for me, I started by asking people, how do I show up? Your first order of business is then ask people. That's your first data point. That's your baseline. You're going to find out where you are today before you aspire to anything else later. I used to do, when I did this exercise, clearly I had no guidance. So I made a lot of mistakes. So I'm going to tell you what not to do. Okay. Don't ask, don't ask people who don't care about you and don't want to see you succeed. Don't ask them that question. Only ask people that care about you, that you know, will tell you the truth, will be candid with you, but also will be kind with you and will tell you, Hey, you know what? You show up like this. Maybe you want to show up like that right? You show up like this and this is how, you know, when you enter the room, Miri, you're just, you're loud, right? You're gregarious. Miri, you tell a lot of jokes. Sometimes you shouldn't tell those jokes. Okay. Right. So, so that's the kind of thing you want people that want to be candid with you, but also want to be kind with you. I didn't have that guidance. And so I went out and asked a whole lot of people, found out I had a lot of haters more than I thought I did, but that was also a good thing. Um, so use, use some anonymous surveys, maybe use some emails and say, Hey, I just took this personal branding thing. And they told me to get my baseline. I want to know how I show up. Um, and that's it. Open in the question with that, you're going to get a lot of answers. Hopefully the more people you ask, the more data you get, and you're going to find patterns, right? You're going to find some patterns and some anomalies as well, but you're going to find some kind of, you know, some data, data points. And you're going to be like, Hey, uh, these connect here, these connect here for me at that time, two things came out of, out of all these different attributes. I had a lot of answers that I noticed that were really important for me. One of them were I showed up sarcastic. So that was a thing. Um, and just to let you know, attributes are all just flat. They're not good or bad. Being sarcastic is not good or bad. Being funny is not good or bad. They just are. It's just how people are defining you in this moment. For me, sarcasm was one of them. The other one was feminist. I was clearly raised a feminist. I came up from the slums of Caracas. I was a hacker. I am a hacker. And so, yeah, I'm a feminist. I'm going to go do that, be that. Um, and But what showed up really for me was important is that when I saw those patterns, I asked myself, back to the statement, I asked myself, who do I want to target for my brand? And that was really important because I realized the world's a big place. So when I went out with those attributes, I was like, I want to show up like this and like this, but who's the world to me? I can't possibly reach 8 billion people on the planet, right? I just can't. But maybe I can reach 10, 100, maybe with social media, a couple thousand, right? So I'm going to target an audience. If you look at every brand coming from marketing, I'll tell you this as a, as a marketing professional, every brand targets an audience. They can have hybrid audiences and they can have extended extended audiences, but the reality is they have a niche audience, a very targeted persona that they target. And if they hit that persona, the rest is history. The rest is like, hey, I, I you know, I, I hit more than I expected, but that that bullseye is really is a target audience. So for me, back to my story, when I first started at Microsoft, when I went back to Microsoft the next day, I decided to go back and I said, look, I'm gonna go back because. Remember, I asked myself why. I'm going to go back because if this is happening to me, it's probably happening to somebody else and maybe younger people, maybe people that are earlier in their career. I was mid-career mid at the time, right? I was mid-level. So I was like, if, if, you know, if it's happening to me, it's possibly happening to other people. Now, I can't change bullies. I can't get rid of bullies, but I can talk about it. I can expose it. And if I do, other people might talk about it too or might talk to me about it and we can expose it. So my why became not me. My story was not about me. What had happened to me was not about me. It became the purpose I gave my brand was how would I use that moment, those stories, um, that really bad year to actually purpose that for good for people that may have been going through or may go through or could go through in the future for some, something like this. What would I tell these people? So I targeted them. And so my target audience became younger women in tech 
early in career, in their 20s. I was in my 30s, in their 20s. Why? Well, I was young enough to connect with them, to be relevant. I was old enough to have gone through life a little bit more that I could talk a little bit about wisdom, right? I wasn't in my 20s like them. I wasn't a peer. I was someone that had been through life a little more. So I could relate to them, but also offer some wisdom. So this is where it gets really interesting. When you think about your brand purpose and you're going to be like, hey, Miri, why just two attributes? We'll get to that. We'll get to that. You could have 10 attributes. You could have 100. It's your life. It's good. For me, it was two. It was two because it's the ones that I could remember, right? So I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. But when you think about who you're going to show up like, for me, it was just the statement. I am blank and blank. I asked, how do I show up? Questions, you know, the people answered. Sarcasm was one. Feminist was one. I was like, okay, well, what am I going to do with that? Who is the world to me? Then I got into storytelling. I didn't know it was called storytelling back then, but I began to use some things that now I know are storytelling and I can plug them in now with a model because um, I used it in a way that I, I worked out my own story. Remember I told you, you were born one day, your story happened. You just didn't know it, right? You were just kind of navigating life and you weren't intentional about branding yourself, but now you will be, now you, you will be. So here's how it starts. You're gonna grab a piece of paper and you're gonna put a data point on that blank sheet of paper. That point could be maybe in the middle of the sheet of paper, maybe it could be on the top at the bottom. That's the day you were born. For me, the day I was born, as uh, it was announced, 1978, it's in, kind of in the middle, it's not a high or low. Uh, hopefully for you, it's a high. For me, it's uh, in the middle because I was born the middle child. And so it wasn't, you know, I, I was born right after my little, my older sister was born, uh, maybe 18 months later, and she was really like spoiled. They loved her when she came into the family. After I came in, it was like, oh my gosh, like you came right, like you got pregnant again. So nobody was really celebrating my birth too much, right? It was just like, Mary's here. Okay. Um, there was a lot of strikes in the country at the time. It was a really bad, like political moment. So it was my, my birth was kind of inconsequential. Like, okay, here comes another baby. Um, then another data point. Um, my sister was born a few, five years later. And that's a low for me because then clearly that made me the little child, the middle child, which nobody wants to be FYI. But just to let you know, what you're going to do is you're going to take this piece of paper for yourself. You're going to put that data point. And from there, you're going to create your origin story. Origin story is basically data points, as I'm mentioning, highs and lows, peaks and valleys, moments that basically um, you remember are encoded in your memory, moments that you know are part of your life and you want to put as part of your life. You're not going to show this to anybody. This is your own origin story. But, you know, just kind of putting together these data points around your life your origin story is what it's called um do it all the way to present so i don't have time we're not going to get through my whole life but i just kind of did halfway until i got married and just kind of showcase and, and illustrate to you what this looks like now i want you to do this all the way through you start with your birth go all the way up and down up and down life 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 until you you get to that point to the present and you're going to use this to create the next story which is actually your brand so how does this work well, first we have to understand what storytelling is, right? We have to understand the mechanics of storytelling. I became a storyteller at Microsoft uh, many years later. I stayed at Microsoft, as you know, and, and sure enough, I, I went on to different groups. I've actually done different, um, different four different organizations within Microsoft, and one of them was engineering. I'm not an engineer. I wish I was, but um, I was called in to do some storytelling around AI and data, uh, and so I, that's when I moved to Seattle three years ago, and so I didn't know how to do this job. I took the job, and by the way, quick plug in because I was talking. Um, I was talking earlier to one of the women here, and I said, you know, a lot of women, most women actually, will look at a job description and they'll say, oh my gosh, it needs five things. I only meet four criteria, so I'm not going to apply. We do that all the time. Please don't do that. You know that men don't do that. Men will be like, oh, it needs five things. I only have three. I'm going to apply. And they apply and they get it because nobody else applies. So please don't do that to yourself. Go ahead and apply, 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 apply. In fact, my one of my mentors says to me, go through all the interviews because that makes you better and better and better. So even if you don't get it, the actual idea of putting yourself out there is a practice and you get better at it and you get better at it. And you can you kind of get get you don't you get immune to rejection. Like, oh, say no, okay, I'm gonna try it again, I'll try it again, I'll try it again. So you get better at it. Anyway. Storytelling is actually something I didn't know how to do. And I took the job anyway. And they you know, they gave it to me, so I, I took the job anyway. So I then figured it out. I said yes, and then went to figure it out. And so to figure it out, I asked a lot of people that were storytellers. Um, I went on LinkedIn, great tool, connected with a lot of people, the title storyteller. 
um, in different brands, Disney, um, Google, Amazon, Marriott, Hyatt, different places. And I didn't ask them what is storytelling. I asked them what is not, right? And so they gave me a whole lot of different answers, of course, as you can expect. It took me a little while to put them together, but here it is. It's not storytelling. It's not opinions. It's not data points, assertions, facts, arguments. It's not marketing. It's not exploitation. I'll explain to you in a little bit what that means. Uh, it's not definitely going on Instagram, posting stories, and calling yourself a storyteller. But here's what's interesting. Those facts, those data points that you just will create for your own brand, um, those data points of your life, your origin story that, that you're going to build, it's not storytelling. Those are only facts. Those are only things that happen. Those are only moments, right? So how to turn that into an actual story? I'm glad you asked. Um, I went on and I didn't find a really good definition online, so I created my own. Uh, this is what I think and I believe storytelling is the best definition of. It's the emotional transfer of that information, of that of those facts, that data. Uh, and it's done through clearly the basic elements of a character, a plot, and a conclusion. Here's where your story takes place. Storytelling that's good is emotional. So those facts, those moments that you have been plotting all the way through the present, that you will plot all the way through your present, they weave it together an emotional journey that becomes who you are. And that is a differ differentiator to your resume. Your resume is full of facts. I don't know from your resume when you share your resume. I don't. I want. I know you went to school. I know you you live in a specific place geographically, but I don't know what that place looks like. I don't know what happened to you in that place. I don't know what it took for you to get to that school. I don't know how many jobs you had to get to subside. Uh, to, you know your your schooling, right? I had to work three jobs at times. Nobody knows that because I don't put that on my resume, right? And that's where emotion is taking out of data. And so now I have a hundred resumes that look the same and they're inconsequential. This is where your story and branding yourself changes that because now you're adding the emotion. The story becomes alive when you begin to tell your story differently. And there's a lot of ways you can do that. And we're gonna talk about that in a minute. So storytelling really is about um, taking those data points and, and turning them into something emotional. Your journey is your differentiator. Nobody has lived your life the way that you have. But where do we begin? Well, at the beginning for me, when I didn't know how to do my job, uh, it took me about three months. In fact, I failed for the first three months. I failed royally, okay, in course services engineering. I was taking a course for my master's at the time, uh, which is design thinking. Some of you may already recognize this. This is a design thinking model, uh, a five-step model to prototyping products. Um, user experience box as well. So it starts with empathy. And I thought that was really interesting. At the time, I called my professor and I said, hey, can we prototype stories? And he said, you can prototype whatever you want. So I was like, okay, great. I'm going to go do that because I'm like, otherwise I'm going to get fired, right? <laughs> I'm like, I've been failing at storytelling for three months. So I went out and I started kind of plugging in the steps to stories. Um, and the first thing I found out was, like, oh my gosh, this is empathy. I don't know. Am I, am I empathetic? I didn't know that was one of my, uh, my attributes or not. In fact, I took a test, Clifton Sten a Strengths test. I recommend that beyond your audience, people that told you how you show up, you take these tests, all of them. Uh, there's some, some of them are free online. Take as many as you can because these all, all of these are data points. Again, you're gathering information about yourself, your personality traits, uh, yeah, all the things that make up who you are, your DNA truly. Um, and so I took this one and it told me that I, Empathy was like number 33 out of 35 attributes. I was like, oh no, I'm going to fail at this because I'm not empathetic. But then I learned that you can actually learn to be empathetic. In fact, you can learn to be anything. All these attributes you can actually hone into and you can learn. They're all soft skills. Did you know that? I didn't know that, but I did learn it. And so I got into being becoming an empath so I could do my job. I went out to look for another definition, empathy. Didn't find a really good one um, until I found this one on USA Today. And this one is, it says that empathy is the experience, the experience of understanding another person's um, life, another person's emotions, another person's um, journey, another person's thoughts, another person's feelings. Uh, in other words, it's, it's really not about putting yourself in someone else's shoes. It's about you walking in those shoes for a long time before you get it. 
how to sing yourself. Because what it does is it, it lets us understand each other in a different way. It lets us understand there's actually three levels of empathy and we can hone into all of them to become better people. And then our story lands authentic, right? The first one is cognitive empathy. And it's he's basically saying they're human. The reality is right now, if I practice co cognitive empathy, I would pause what I'm doing. I would pause this presentation and I would acknowledge you right now, wherever you find yourself in the world. I don't know you. I haven't had the honor to meet you, but just because you're human, just because you're out there past my screen, I'm connecting with you right now. Thank, thankful for technology for that. But I can attest, I could probably predict that just because you're human, there's something going on, possibly something negative. I mean, clearly there's a lot of stuff happening right now in the world. There's people dealing with an illness. Somebody you may know has an illness. Maybe you have the illness right? The human condition, just for that reason, that just showcases the fact that we are all one and then we're all equal inside. So I don't have to, I don't have to know your whole life story, but I have to recognize that you are human and that changes the perspective and how I treat you or how I connect with you, right? And so if we were to practice cognitive empathy right now, we would ask ourselves, we just kind of zoom out and be like, hey, you know, besides feeling claustrophobic in my house, how about I stop to thinking about myself and how I'm feeling right now? And I start thinking about someone else, maybe somebody who has COVID right now. How are they, how are they feeling physically? People that can't breathe or emotionally, right? They're in a the hospital. So cognitive empathy as a practice helps us zoom out to think about everyone. They are human, not just me. I'm not the only human. They are human. And then we have emotional empathy. And it really talks about we are human, right? So now I allow, I allow, I allow myself to come into that space, be vulnerable as well with my emotions. This type of empathy allows me to um, connect with you at the very human level. No longer is it Miri from Microsoft, Miri this, Miri the author. I'm just, I'm a person. Right. And by that, then I get to really level off the fact and the idea that what I do affects other people. I mean, COVID has shown this in the most pervasive way. I think one person doing one thing can really affect a lot of other people. We are not an island. And this is where your story is important, because sometimes we think our story is about ourselves. But when you think about your story and what what's happened and what's happening or the things that maybe the really horrible things that have happened to you or maybe the really great things that have happened to you, they are they're built in a way that with purpose can serve someone beyond yourself, not just you. That's the legacy. That was what happened to me. I went beyond myself. I took a chance. I took an idea. I took a purpose. I said, you know what? I'm going to go back and I'm going to do something not just for me, not just for me. And so then you become a compassionate empath that basically allows you to take that sheet of paper with all those data points that you're going to build uh, from the moment you were born until the present and you're going to go tell people hey i have a story i'm human there's stuff that happened to me um, and i want to share it and it's beyond again the data points It's beyond where you went to school it's beyond your gpa it's beyond your aspirations for career that's only one very small aspect of who you are it doesn't define you by the way you define you. And so that's where you begin to think about yourself. You check in with yourself, recognize your own emotions. What are you made of? What are you made of? What, what inspires you? What motivates you? Your data points are going to help you out. In fact, I didn't know I was a writer until I started writing a book, right? Somebody came to me and said, hey, you should write a book. I was like, really? I, did. I, told, I said no, by the way, at the, at the beginning, I was like, no, I don't think I should write a book. I don't, I don't, I'm like, that's not for me. But then I realized I did this exercise and I realized one of the things that I remembered, I forgot about it when I was older, but I, for, I remember I went back to my exercise and I remembered I used to write when I was about seven years old, I used to write books of poetry. I had lots and lots of books that I wrote myself of poetry. So that means I put in my 10,000 hours right? I was a writer before I even knew I was a writer. Before I was a published writer, I had written a lot of different books. And so when you think back to those moments of weaving the story, those data points are going to help you come back and think about the things that you did, that you enjoyed, these talents you had that you that were natural to you, these passions and these things that continue to be you, that haven't stopped being you. You just forgot. You forgot, right? We get into this idea of like, I have to go to school. I have to become this. I have to do this. I have to do that. And by the time I'm 30, I have to do this. By the time I'm 40, I have to do this. Says who? Who, who? who taught us that? Why is that? 
Why do we think that by the time we are 30, we have to, we have to do something or not? Who, sa who said that? Write your own set of values. Write your own set of milestones. Um, that doesn't make you a failure if you don't achieve something by a certain time. It makes you a doer. You're thinking about your future. You're aspiring to something and you continue to do it. So recognize that your humanity, you are more than one aspect of your life. You're more than a title. You're more than, you're everything. I'm a mom, I'm a sister, I'm a friend, I'm a, um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a cousin, I am a worker, I'm a writer. I'm so many things. I'm so many things. And none of them define me. All of them do, right? And so I owe it to all of these spaces of my life to be the best of all of these things. So let's think about designing your story, for example. You have all these data points. Uh, we have attributes to give you. One thing that we do to empathize is to find a universal truth. What do I mean there? I mean that you're going to find something that awakens people's emotions. Your brand should spark an emotion. What emotion? I don't know. You get to decide. Um, what you see here is Maslow's pyramid of needs. You may have seen this before. It's a very popular theory. It's really the theory around needs, the theory about human needs that we have basic needs. And then as humans, we want to self-fulfill is our top goal, right? So we have the needs to fulfill ourselves. That's, that's success to us. What I want to showcase here is that we all go through this process, and that means that if your brand is able to attain to one of those emotions, those needs, you can actually target people. I'll give you an example. For me, I realized I needed to belong, right? When my story, I needed to belong. And then I realized if I needed to belong, maybe there's other women who needed to belong. So my need became, my target audience, my need, their need became belonging. You see how that, how that works? Think about things in your, in your life. Think about those moments. What has happened to you where you can speak to the emotion or lack thereof, something that maybe didn't feel you, make you feel empowered, something that may, made you feel the opposite of that? Could there be an audience that went through that or is going through that you can talk to with your story, that you can target with your content, that you can target with your and actually purpose um, and talk, to, talk about that? Right. And so that's how it works. You start thinking about this feeling that your brand is going to spark. For me, I told you before, I showed up sarcastic. I showed up feminist. Um, and I was like, I don't know if that's going to work. I don't know if that sparks the feeling of belonging uh, with the specific audience. So this is what happened. I began to define that step two is def defining. So I empathize. I spent a lot of time empathizing uh, and then defining. I started to define my story mission my audience, my character, my plot, my conclusion. Again, defining who you are in your story is really important. At that time, I defined myself as the Robin to the Batman. That's why I have a Robin there, not a Batman. I was not going to make myself the hero of the story. My story was about these young women that are coming into tech that don't know if they belong and that they feel lost. I wanted them to not feel lost because I felt lost for a year. It was rough. It wasn't fun. And so I enable them. I'm the psychic. I want to tell them, hey, listen, if you have a bad day, come talk to me. We can just talk about it. Maybe it just makes you feel better. That gave me purpose, right? I gave myself that purpose and I made myself available. And guess what? Women started coming to me. It started happening. I started with one and two, and then all of a sudden, it was it expanded all over the world. All of a sudden, I, I started having people come to me and say, oh my gosh, this happened to me. This happened to me. I went on LinkedIn. I started talking about it right? And people were, were sending me, em me emails and going, wow, this happened to me too. Oh my gosh, I feel the same way. I was so scared to do that. But if I didn't do it, these women wouldn't have had that story to share with me, right? So again, you define those moments that you've lived. You look at that chart, chart and you go, where can I plug this in? And where can I share in, in this story? And this is what happened. I began to actually think about my purpose differently. Remember I told you I was a feminist and I was uh, sarcastic. When I defined my audience, I made my audience these young women in tech, I called them my girls. I was like, well, you know, sarcasm doesn't really sit well with my girls, especially if I wanna be a global audience. Sarcasm can be, you know, kind of authoritative. It can be a little crash, uh, um, harsh. And then especially here in America, it's kind of dim witty, but not outside of America. It's not a good, trait to have. Um, feminist, you could say it's a good trait. Again, these are all neutral, not good or bad. But for me, when I looked at my audience, back to the audience, I realized 
that may not land well. Um, here in the Western part of the world, feminism has become, as, a, as an entity, has become a, a movement of, of almost extremism, uh, of men bashing. And, and that wasn't, I wasn't aligned to that. I didn't want to be aligned to, or even deemed to, misconstrued to be, oh, she's fe she calls herself feminist. Maybe she, she's, a, you know, she's one of those extremists. So I toned it down a little bit and I became feminine and kind. So what I want to sh share here is when you have your attributes, when you get those answers back from people to tell you how you show up and you find those patterns and you say, okay, well, I show up shy, right? That's, that's, that's an attribute, not a good, bad, not a good or bad. It just is. Um, but I want to be the president of the, of the, of the, of the Republic of the country. Well, you probably have to work on your shyness a little bit, right? Because you're going to have to show up a little bit differently. So depending on what you want to do, how you want to target yourself, if your audience is big tech companies, um, you have to show up, you know, if you're going to target the audience, you have to show up and allure them with your presence, with your with your brand. So there are opportunities. In fact, there are all your opportunities to really pivot your brand, to shape your attributes in the best way. Now, before we get into my girls, I wanted to ask, I tell you, why do I have two, not 10? Well, it's simple for me to remember. It just became kind of the overarching attributes for me. Being feminine means I was going to, every time I went online, every time I talked to somebody, every time I dressed I show up feminine. There's these attributes about uh, being kind, being uh, you know having a servant's heart, having being community driven. That to me is feminine, and so that's for me was a big, big, big attribute that could just you know um, cover up a whole lot of other ones. It could be like the umbrella attributes. The other one is kind as well. So for me, again, I want to show up in my speech, in my tone when I when I came into the room that I would be a kind person to people, that I would be open because I needed to be that for me. I needed to be relatable and I need to be approachable to my audience. Now, am I always feminine and kind? For the most part, that's what I've become. I've, 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 I've uh, honed into those attributes. But, you know, when I switch audiences, definitely I can switch myself. If I go and talk to IT pros, I know very well because I've been in that field, right? I know very well that IT pros like to be poignant, to the point, uh, very dry, very almost sarcastic, could be sarcastic at times. So I guess what? I'm sarcastic. So I turn it over, right? And I'm like, and I talk the language. So what I'm saying here is when you target your audiences with your brand, you get to choose those attributes that you want to highlight to, to basically target your brand, to allure that brand. My girls needed reassurance in order to close the equality gap. You see how I filled that out? I gave myself a purpose. I used a moment in my life and I decided to use that moment. It could be a good or bad one. It could be a neutral one. It doesn't matter. It's not extraordinary. I didn't live in an extraordinary, it was a normal life. Something just happened to me in my life. I'm sure something's happened to you in your life. Just use that, elevate that and think about the purpose that you can give that moment to actually go beyond yourself and give your brand a purpose. And then you give your story a mission. So this is a brand mission, your brand, and then your story, that sheet of paper has a mission. You tell, you say, hey, my story, I'm going to dedicate it to, in this case, we're my girls, my girls, and you create a persona, a demographic. You start doing research about this brand, uh, Target, um, this audience that you're going to have. For me, I spent a lot of time, the internet is out there, there's a lot of information. We live in the information age to find out what they like, what they don't like, where they are, where they're not. Right. So if you think, for example, your goal is to get into Google, into Microsoft, a big tech company, these are entities. They're treated like like people, like target audiences. They have a mission. They have a birthday. Right. They have values. They have things they do. They have products. So when you look at the entity the, and you say, I'm going to target big tech companies, find the persona, find the demographics, who works there, find the, you know, all, all, everything about it, create a persona for your target. And then you say, okay, what am I going to do with this? This is my audience. What am I going to do? What's the mission of my brand? Right. And then how I'm going to make them feel very important. That feeling is the most important thing, because guess what? You're not going to remember 70% of what I just said. You gonna remember how I made you feel with what I just said. So your brand really is about the feeling it evokes to people. For me, again, I needed to make my feel, my girls feel like they belong. Security was important to give them. So you begin to design the story, okay? You define your attributes, overarching attributes. Well, first you define who you are at the moment. Get that baseline, find out how you show up. Um, just ask the question. 
And then from that, you're going to find those patterns and you can say, okay, maybe I need to elevate this attribute. This is what I'm going to do for this target audience. My target audience is this one. So I'm going to go do this and I'm going to elevate these attributes. And then you ideate. This is a really fun part of brand storytelling. This is the part where you get to actually define different parts of the story, layer it up, if you will. If I were to ask you, what does your brand smell like? What is the color of your brand? How would you describe it? This is the kind of idea that you're thinking about. Well, I was going to start my story with my dad, but now I'm going to replace the character. Now I'm going to add my brother. Um, you know, I'm going to mo modify the plot. I'm going to start my story not when I was born, but when I was 15. Um, I'm going to eliminate something from it. I'm not going to have to tell the whole story. By the, by the way, you don't have to tell the whole story. You get to choose parts of your story, right? That's what's important about this. You get to brand yourself. You are the CEO of your life. You get to choose. This is your life journey. So you get to choose it. But know that the more you share, the more compelling it becomes, the more emotional it becomes. In fact, the more differentiated it becomes because not you know people want to get people get curious about you. It's it's true. It, it, you don't have to have an like, incredible life. It just just who you are and why you want to do what you do, just sharing that people get curious about because we're connected as humans. Uh, if you combine something in the story, if you decided you're going to um, tell two types of stories, it's all good, right? So this is a, a called Scamper. It's one of the brainstorming tools. You don't have to use this one. You can do different types of stories. I recommend another one actually called uh, Storyboarding. You may have heard of that. Take that sheet of paper that you have, like those data points, and actually turn them into six panels, six sheets of papers. And tell the story again of those data points, but only in drawings or paintings, no words. And put them all around the room, since we have a whole lot of time right now because we're on lockdown, right? So you get to get creative. Put them all around the room and then see if the story is told the best way. Do it again, do it again. Like if somebody came in that room and they saw that storyline, could they tell your life story? And that will give you a whole lot. Your brain is going to wake up in so many ways and you're going to remember so many great things. You're going to add layers to your story. And you're going to go, oh my gosh, just like me, I forgot I wrote a poetry book and I was seven, right? You're going to start finding these, these amazing moments that you're going to be able to weave into your brand story. And then you get to actually prototype it, right? How are you going to go tell that story? How are you going to show up? Now, I know of the point you're like, okay, Miri, what does it have to do with my career? Everything it has everything to do with your career because you know what? Once you define the story, that shows up on your resume, that shows up on your d digital media, that shows up in the way that you write an email, that shows up in everywhere. You define yourself and then you get to ask yourself, hey, did I show up feminine and kind? Hey, is that email feminine and kind? Hey, is my Instagram feminine and kind? Because you've branded yourself. And so now, People know you for that. They don't. They can't tell that's what you're doing, but they, they know your brand. They recognize your brand, right? We recognize brands, and sometimes we don't even know that that, that you know that they're doing that on purpose. Yeah, they've they've branded themselves. That's the word in a way that we get to recognize them. And they don't say this is our brand attributes. They just they show up. So you're gonna show up the same way. You're gonna show up and you're gonna brand yourself. This here are eight basic techniques to storytelling, uh, different ways, if you will, that you can tell your own story. Um, the first one in the middle, you see this guy falling in this little hole. This is called in media rest. Um, and this is about this idea of you telling the story from the climax point. So saying something like, My mother died when I was five. And people go, whoa, right? And they tune in. And you turn around and tell the rest of the story. Uh, on the top left, drama, it's that, that one's called The Mountain. If you're Latina like me, your stories live right there. It's like drama, 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 peak, drop. Very dramatic people. That's who we are uh, from a cultural standpoint. At the bottom uh, right, you have the Lion King storyline. That's uh, the transformational journey. Also the hero's journey storyline. A lot of stories around this. A lot of Hollywood, a lot of poetry, a lot of historic and religious accounts are made of this transformational journey. There's so many things here. There's so many ways to tell a story. Look them up. Uh, and if they don't exist the way you want them, create your own. Create your own way to tell the story, to come out with that brand. You don't have to follow somebody else's. You can create your own. This is your, your story. This is your brand. Uh, you can combine them, right? There's different ways to tell a story. But the important thing here is that you get to prototype stories. You get to create and say, well, I'm going to come out on Medium and start blogging my story. Or I'm going to go on Instagram and start sharing photos of my story. Or I'm going to get on LinkedIn and start putting stuff on my about my story. So you get to choose where and how. Now, what's really important is the where, because that depends on who your audience is. Now, when I decided to target my audience, uh, I found out that they were on LinkedIn. They also were on Instagram. So I had to open an Instagram account. 
I really was not a, a, into it, but I knew my audience was there. So I'm not going to ask people to come to me. I'm not going to create a website and say, come see me. I actually went to them and started sharing my story with them to relate to them, to connect with them. That's how it works. When you target an audience, whatever that is, when you target your purpose is, Hey, I'm going to start talking. I want to, I want to start helping, you know, kids in middle school, or I want to start connecting with engineers, uh, you know, that, that are specific to uh, as a discipline at, at a company. You start going to the spaces, you know, you start going to, are they, are they on TikTok? Probably not. If they're engineers, they're probably going to be on Reddit. So go to Reddit, connect with them there. So you get to define these little prototypes of storytellings of your brand. So you can get out there and do what will find where they are. And then you show up, you show up. This is me on LinkedIn. Um, I began to target for many years, took me about five years, my audience young women in tech. I found out through a lot of research that they love puppies. They love me talking about relationships. They love me talking about love or hate or breakups. So I post things that connect with them. Now, a lot of people have come to me and say, hey, Miri, why are you posting stuff like that on LinkedIn? This is not Facebook. And I'm like, well, thank you, Captain Obvious. I know it's not Facebook, but this was not for you. What happens is that you get empowered when you target your audience. You see, I don't care if nobody else likes this, but my audience, it was for them. This content is for them. When you start branding yourself, you really don't have to worry about anybody else but the audience that you're targeting. And guess what? Your audience will respond because the content is for them. It's emotional. You've targeted them. You know what they like, what they don't like, and you begin to prototype different stories. Now, I didn't arrive at this immediately. It took me years, as I said. It was a lot of testing. I had to test myself. I had to test my content. And then based on the responses through the journey, I knew what they liked or didn't like, what they responded to or didn't. And then I went to different channels. On Twitter, I have a different audience. Most of my audience on Twitter is actually men, males in engineering. A lot of people from engineering follow me on Twitter. And so I know this also in communications and marketing. So I get a little bit, you know, I could be a little bit more sarcastic, a little bit more sassy, if you will, on Twitter. And then on Instagram, right? Same thing. I began to, sh I knew that we're there. This is completely my audience. So I get a little bit more of myself, right? I show a whole lot more of who I am. I don't have to be like, oh, I have to, I have to be on LinkedIn, a professional. And then on Instagram, you know, myself, and I can't combine. What do you mean? You can't combine the two. You're one person. I sh it should not be a surprise when you see me on LinkedIn or Twitter or Instagram. I'm the same person. I don't stop being a mom when I go to work. I don't stop being a sister. I don't stop being, you know, uh, whatever I am. I'm all these things always. I'm, I'm on all the time. So you begin to empower yourself to show up all the time everywhere. And I ask myself again, am I being feminine and kind? Is my brand feminine and kind? Is my brand feminine and kind? And then when I start doing this, when I start doing this, people get curious. And then you know what? There's my Google panel. When I Google myself, actually people got so curious, they created a panel right? And it wasn't because I did anything extraordinary. I didn't go to the moon. I just began to brand myself and prototype my stories and people began to tune in. That's the magic of personal branding. That's the magic of you using something that happened to you in your life to drive it, to tell a story, to brand yourself. How do you use this on a resume? Well, the resume is going to be what it's going to be, right? You're going to be able to use a real estate and say, hey, I'm someone who is passionate about this passionate about that. I'm excited about this. Um, but be, I'm beyond that. I'm more than that. I'm more than a worker. I'm more than a student. I'm looking forward to doing this in my life because I, I, my, my passion for this awakens. Uh, and you're able to add and weave those data points into your story, into your LinkedIn profile in a way that people go, oh, wow, there's more to this person to bring to the table. There's a lived experience beyond um, you know, where they went to school or their work. So you, be, you begin to test it. You ask yourself, hey, did my story evoke the emotions that I wanted? For example, if you target recruiters, if that's going to be your target audience, because the first thing you want to do is get recruited, get hired. Um, what, what are they like? What don't they like? Begin to test them. Begin to get into their space. Begin to understand what stories resonate with them. What do you want them to feel? Inspired? Curious about you? 
you get to do that. You get to fill that, that those those um, things in, those blanks, to, to actually do something for them that goes beyond yourself. Change something if it didn't work, right? A lot of times I threw out content out there and to brand myself, flat, landed super flat. But that's okay. I learned from it. I was like, okay, now I know what not to do, and I'm going to go do what I'm going to go do. Test it again, test it again, test it again, test it again. And that's that's personal branding. Your origin story is your differentiator. It really is what's gonna set you apart from everything, from everyone, because nobody's lived that experience. You bring insight. You know what insight is? Insight is not, I read an article and that's it. So you share the article. It's I read an article and here's what I think about that article. Here's my insights about that. Here's what my thought process. Now you're adding insight, wisdom from your lived experience. We're all consuming content differently. We could read the same article and get something different out of it. That's because of our lived experience, right? So you get to do the same and share that with people. People love, love to be educated. Magic for content when you brand yourself is three things. Your content should be educational. That means insightful. That means I don't get to Google it. If I get to Google it, then, then you've given me nothing. You, I can just Google it. It needs to be beyond Google, right? Insightful. It needs to be inspirational. People love to be inspired. What is your message to the world? What are you gonna go say? You've lived, you, you've lived long enough to have something to tell people. And you may not think it's important. It is important because the things you've been through can help someone else. That's inspirational and personal. You have to get out there out of your comfort zone and be vulnerable. Storytelling is about empathy and vulnerability. You have to be willing to put your story out there. I had to, I had to do it. I had to do it. And if I didn't do it, I wouldn't be here today. Because I made that decision many years ago to share that story, I can share it with an audience all over the world right now. That's incredible to me. Stories are for your audience. They're not to your audience. That means that they're empathetic, that you practice the skill set. You become that. You think about emotions. You talk about emotions. You know what we're doing right now? Um, marketers all over the world are thinking about brands and how to be emotional and empathetic right now. Before, years ago, we had to have the male attributes, if you will, of a brand. Strong, leader, un unemotional, pragmatic, and now everybody's like, oh, we got to be a, an empathetic brand. We have to be, communicate better. We have to be emotional, right? All the female attributes, what they call them. So this is a great time for you to show up. All of you, authentic, authentic. You don't have to show up all put together and strong. I don't even know what that even means. You can have emotion. You can have failure. You can have all the things that you are because you are that. When you say stories are for your audience, that means you're going to take time to craft them. You're going to take time to build your story. You're going to take time to storyboard them. So you're going to spend time to build your brand. It's a long haul appro appro approach. It's not going to be overnight. But once you start doing it, you're going to find your way. You're going to find your inspiration. You're going to find your audience. Ideate, ideate, ideate. Spend time with yourself. Spend time thinking again. What is my brand? What are my attributes? Ask people. Get creative and do it with heart. That's the biggest thing. Find the purpose. Find the purpose. Find yourself. Learn yourself enough to go. What is my legacy? Nobody at the end of the uh, at the end of their lives is going to say, "Oh, I wish I would have got that one promotion. I wish I would have worked one extra hour." Right? Its legacy is beyond that. That's just the means. What is the end for you? That's what branding is about. You finding that for yourself. I didn't have it. I didn't know I could find that from a moment from a something that had been negative for me. But I used it and I leveraged it once I did. I found my why. What is your why? I would like for you to connect with me. I know there's uh, some time that we're going to leave for Q&A. So please connect with me if I don't get to answer your questions uh, on Instagram, on LinkedIn. Um, you can go to my website. Also, the uh, brand storytelling book will help you as well, as was announced earlier. That will kind of give a little deeper, get a little deeper into this uh, idea of brand story, personal branding for yourself. Wow. So um, with this, we are towards the end, a very insightful um, webinar. And to, just to conclude, your brand should spark an emotion. Very simple. If it does, you'll be there where you really have to be. Well, uh, maybe we have a couple of questions and then we can quickly wrap it up. So uh, Vinod Sharma asks, how do we align our personal brand along with the organization and the role we are in? And how do we improve the personal branding? 
I love that. Yeah. So the way you align is you you define your own set of values, right? So you get to define that for yourself and nobody gets to do that for you. Um, for, for us, for example, for my family, we have five core values. Um, and so for us, I'll share them with you. Our core values in our family are our family five. We call it the family five. So it's love God, uh, family first, um, work hard, be generous and always tell the truth. Those are five values that to us as a family yeah. unit we follow. How do you align that with a company? Well, if I work for a company, in fact, I'll tell you a story. I was asked once to be a spy and uh, and to actually work for a company that was a spy. <laughs> No, <laughs> I had to say no because it didn't align to my my values, right? I always told the truth is a value. So if I became a spy, that probably wouldn't align to what I was doing. So so when you set up your own core values, you align yours to the brand. And that also make, helps you make decisions around which brand you're going to work for, which company you want to work for, or even entrepreneurship, right? We, I know we're going to talk about entrepreneurship. That defines your next step as an entrepreneur. What is your company going to be about? What, what are you going to deliver to the world? You define that very first thing for yourself and then that goes out to the world so that's how you align it okay thank you for that uh well now we have another question by yeah. gitanjali sachdev it's a very much of a um university level student um typical question yes ma'am what skills should one indulge in in the initial stages to grab an internship or a job in Microsoft. Yes. Yeah, I know. I know that we were going to get internships, uh, into internships as well, and entrepreneurship. So I do want to say all of these things around branding do appeal to it, both entrepreneurship and internship. Once you define that for yourself, it's easier for you to. You don't just get a job just to get the job, or because you know that's what you're supposed to do. You do it with purpose, which is what's really important. So for internships. Um, we have we have several types of internships around the world and 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 throughout the different seasons the main ones are here in summer where we have um the majority of undergrad internships that happen during summertime right now we are sold out for internships for summer um we already have uh, you know we capped out but we um again we continue to hire for the next seasons and the next season things that we look for in terms of a a, a successful candidate um the story for us, we're thinking about diversity and inclusion. What does that look like? Well, that looks like your story. For us, diversity is not only underrepresented communities, but it's how you tell me what your lived experience looks like, what, what it brings to the table, the insight that you bring. If if I met, if we want to hire somebody, um, you know, not only the hard skills that are important, uh, which they are, we have engineering, obviously, different types of engineering, uh, software engineering, uh, hardware as well. But that, you know, the, the coding is important. But beyond that, why are you here? Why do you not want to? Why do you want to come here and not Google? And again, that that's part of aligning yourself to the value of the company. Do you believe in the values of the company? And if you do, why do you believe in the values of the company? It's very important. So the why and the how are the two questions you guys need to really look into yourself to be in Microsoft. Well, uh, we have one more by Atharth, and he says, while in the process of uplifting yourself. Positive uh, affirmations are good. Although, how exactly do I keep my expectations realistic? Yeah, you create your own set of expectations. You know, here's here's what I learned from my my own perspective. A lot of people are going to have expectations of you. Your parents have them. Your family, extended family has it. Society has it. Uh, everyone has an expectation of you. And you're going to be very overwhelmed when you don't meet those expectations. I was. Sure. I was very sure. And I felt like a failure. Um, when you set your own set of expectations, you do that by by defining your own success. What is success to me? And then it doesn't matter what else, what else everybody else says. You define that. For me, I got to define that like this. To me, success is I recognize I'm many things. Like I said, I'm a mom, I'm a wife, I'm a sister, I'm a friend, uh, I'm I'm a worker. So can I give the when I when I look at all of the things that I am, I can only have so much energy and time and during my day. Can I give my best to all these things? And where can I prioritize those things? At the end of the day, when I look back and I say, was I the best mom? Was I the best sister? Was I, did I try my best in, in these areas? If the answer is yes, that is success to me. So you define that for yourself and, and don't let anybody else set those expectations for you. It's really your life. You're the CEO of your life. And then you won't feel the pressure. It's really self-imposed of having to meet expectations that other people have for you. 
Perfect. Believe in yourself. Very simple. Believe in yourself because you only live once. Well, this is my uh, personal favorite question, and really like uh, you didn't write in our audience, because a lot of us um, really want to start our blog, start our YouTube channel, post whatever we want to. But there's yeah. so much hatred outside. People clicking the dislike button, not oh, yeah. connecting with you. How do we deal with hatred and negative? Uh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a quintessential question. Yes. So you are going to get haters all the time. I get them all the time. Um, the target audience is really important because when you target them, then you only focus on that audience and what they have to say. When I post content that it goes to my audience and my audience doesn't respond, then I know that I need to fix something Then I know that that's feedback for me because I'm targeting the audience. When I post content for my audience and anybody else is giving me feedback, I don't care who they are. Uh, the block button is a real thing and it's a beautiful thing. And you get to do that. You get to delete <laughs> their post, you get to block them and you don't get to talk to them again. Um, and that's a very empowering thing. If they're not part of my target audience, I don't care who they are. Plain and simple. So you get to empower yourself to deal with cyberbullying and to deal with people that are going to come to contact. Don't be paralyzed by these fears. I get so many people say, I can't, I get so shy. I don't know what they're going to say. Who are they? Do they pay your rent? If they don't, you know, if they're nobody in your life, like, don't worry about what they have to say. They're probably just being haters. Delete them and keep going. And you're going to find that for all the posts that you get, you're going to have more love than hate. I have a lot of people that love my content versus the people that don't. And if they, and if they don't, it wasn't for them anyway. Perfect. I mean, so don't be shy to hit the blog button. That'll make your life so much easier. But on that note, that is a wrap. Thank you, Marie, for joining us. Thank for, you for having those me. of you who don't know, Marie is joining us. And it's past midnight at her hour. She's currently in Seattle. So there's a 12 and a half hour time gap. So thank you for complying to my sure. request and coming out in such an inconvenient hour. Thank you to sure. all our attendees from all across the world for joining us. I hope this webinar has been really productive, insightful. Uh, and and I'm sure it has been because Miri has done what she's best at, and that's educating, you know, encouraging people and um, imparting knowledge. So, yeah, we'll be back with another episode of Webinars with the North Cap University. Please stay tuned. Powered and organized by ITM, um, I, uh, IEEE at the North Cap University. Thank you for joining us. Stay tuned. Uh, subscribe to our LinkedIn page. Uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Connect with us on LinkedIn and like our YouTube uh send us your feedbacks uh we'd love to hear them and have a look at miri's book the description uh the link is in the description box this is me priyanshi katuria signing off for the day thank you very much for joining us you all may disconnect bye bye marie i'll bye. i'll catch you really soon i guess you should hit the snooze button and i'll talk to you maybe tomorrow <laughs> in the morning catch you tomorrow i hope that you uh, connect with me if i didn't get to answer your question i'd love to do that online perfect perfect bye bye